Welcome back to Real Cast Fishing. Your host, Glenn, with the City Battle Fishing Field Team, C O A F Field Team on YouTube. And this round, what would he got for you? Well, we're talking the Little Red Book of Fly Fishing. That's where I just go through the uh, a fly fishing book that has some really good tips about fly fishing, specifically for trout. But hey, it works for other fishies. Uh, and in this case, I'm going through tips 81 through 85. So we do them in sections of five. And this round, we're going to do 81 through 85. So I'll start things off. I'll read through it. And then we'll roll right into some pat particular things to point out. And then we'll just shift over to some general Q&A ramblings or maybe some real uh, recent updates from um, uh, from from some recent things here and hey since it's saturday your truly is going to have them a little ipa so join me with a little ipa if you can hmm and if you aren't uh wanting that get some juice or something anyhow let's go ahead and start out with the first tip tip 81 all right uh, you're fishing a dry fly on a smooth flowing stream you see the rise ring of a feeding trout and are ready to make sure or make your cast. At this point, I got to put my glasses on here. It's vital to understand just where the fish really is and where you should place your trout. Okay. Where you should place your fly. Correction. To make this judgment, you need to understand a trout's economy of motion as it pertains to hydraulics. Unless chasing a fast-moving meal, trout never hurry. In life's game of calories gained versus energy expanded, slow and steady is the rule. The rhythm works something like this. When a trout sees an insect entering its window of vision, it tips its body upward and allows a current to lift it to the surface and slightly backward, much like a kite in the wind. This means that at this means that point at which trout meets the fly generally is slightly downstream from its original holding lie. Distance depending upon speed of current following the take, the fish winds back to the comfort of its original watch point beneath the surface. To place the fly properly, you'll need to calculate this holding place, then cast just upstream from the window to achieve the same presentation of naturals in the drift. Your fly must land a yard, perhaps more upstream from where you saw the rise ring. Once you learn the riddle of distance and rhythm, you'll start catching more fish. Hey, signed by KD. Okay, so that makes sense. Uh, the trout wants to minimize the amount of energy expended uh, to, to get his dinner. And in this case, it's just describing how they kind of lay in a particular location in the river. And when it's time to drift up it'll point itself upward get the dinner and then go back down and so it's kind of telling you to go ahead and cast further don't cast to where the trout is sitting but instead cast further and find that money zone where he, this trout is basically um feeding off what's passing so hey, it's a good one it, it's worked i've done that on the blue river i've done that in uh oklahoma's blue river correction as well as over there at um, Broken Bow. Uh, another thing that I like doing is I definitely like having polarized glasses so I can kind of get a good lay of where that fish is. And like it's saying, uh, you know, fish just upstream from it. Okay, so that was tip 81. Okay, let's go to tip 82, that vision thing. To gauge how best the present, or to gauge how to best present fake food to trout it's important to know and <clears throat> to know how and what they see the same basic understanding is also vital when trying to approach a fish without being sighted books have been written on the subject in this brief context it's enough to know the that trout view the world out and upward through a cone-shaped window very narrow at the eye of the fish and progressively broader with the distance of the surface for a trout holding six feet beneath the surface, the oval window is much larger than at three feet, and so on. To a trout sipping floating mayflies from a watch point a foot beneath the surface, the window is quite small. Place your fly in a drift that brings it inside this window, and you'll probably get a rise outside. Nothing. <clears throat> you'll probably get a rise outside 
nothing. So if you miss that window, oops, it's probably going to be a miss and you won't get that fish. Precise presentation is paramount for rising trout. All right. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Uh, that was tip 82. And it goes with the first tip where I was talking about basically getting it to a trout in its feeding zone. Well, this is also talking vision wise to get it into that, um, I guess, window. And the deeper it is, the, the, the larger the cone, higher up, the lesser the cone. All right, tip 83, timing the rise. While considering placement of a fly so a trout can see it, an angler must take into account the element of casting to a fish rising in a regular rhythm to naturals. This is where timing comes in. The process described earlier in which a trout lists to eat an insect and then returns to its station requires a brief period of time, perhaps three or four seconds. During a dense hatch with lots of insects available in the drift, it's relatively easy to know the shortest of these intervals and gauge your presentation accordingly. If you rush the cast, your fly will appear before the trout is ready, perhaps providing an awkward view as it slides past, causing alarm. Wait too long, and the trout likely will have taken a natural instead, causing you to repeat the process with a greater chance you'll spook the fish. So again, it's 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 back to the fish have great vision. Make sure you uh, keep that in mind when you are fishing a particular location and particular fishies. And let me move my little window here so you can read. Uh, and, and so for those that are listening on the podcast, the, the video portion, I'm showing actual passage from the book and I'm reading from there. And then from at that point, we'll just discuss some key, key tips and whatnot out of it. And then we'll shift over to um, some general discussion. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Uh, Here, um, it's showing just a picture of someone catching a fish. And then finishing out tip 83, particularly with fish that receive lots of pressure, it's important to make your first presentation a good one. Take a moment to survey the situation. Gauge the rhythm to get the timing right. Okay, another good one from the book. All right, let's go to tip 84 from the Little Red Book of Fly Fishing. Be a sneak. Knowing what a trout can see affects the way we approach them. Since trout have a blind spot to the rear, an approach from downstream is generally best. There are other considerations. However, the cone of vision as it pertains to the angle of refraction of light means that it's sometimes easier to approach a trout holding in very shallow water or near the surface. That is true only up to a point. The variable comes in or comes when an angler is guilty of heavy footfalls along the shore. Interesting. Heavy footfalls. Uh, That kind of makes sense when you spook a fish as you get closer to the uh, edge of a pond or or whatnot. All right. So the variable comes when an angler is guilty of heavy footfalls along shore or making waves or splashing when wading. Trout near the surface are particularly sensitive to vibration while those in deeper or turbulent waters much less so. A shallow fish may not see you, but it can sense your presence from a considerable distance. Approach with caution. An angler can remove himself from a trout's area of vision by reducing his height. For example, a fisherman wading waist deep or crouching from his knees becomes half as tall. With a stealthy approach, he can shorten the distance of his cast and make a more accurate presentation. Conversely, An angler casting from a high bank should expect to make much longer casts to avoid being seen. Sign CM. And then uh, in the in the video, or it's showing a picture of an angler, a fly fisherman on his knees, kneeling, and he's looks like he's trying to cast into a river so he doesn't spook any fish. So, hey, I I I believe that one. I spooked many a trout. because, well, I was waiting too roughly, stomping my feet too much, or in this case, my my they got sight of something. And then I, I do recall, um, I think it was a fly fishing guide that I met. He suggested also um, wearing kind of drab colors so you don't spook anything that uh, may, may be, you know, see those colors and get all flashy looking and spook them, so... Keep that in your back pocket. Okay, last one for this round. Tips 81 through 85. We're going to end at 85, and then we'll shift the other to other, or shift the subject to open Q&A or, um, well, some updates that I have as well. So tip 85, off Broadway. 
when casting to a fish that's visible near the surface on a sunny day, be aware that shadow from your line will cause it to spook. To prevent this, direct false casts away from the fish and on the opposite side from the sun. Only when you get the distance right and are ready for the presentation should you then cast toward the trout. Okay, well, hey, that's another good one to keep in your back pocket. Um, just don't do a bunch of false casts where it's just flying right over where the trout are lingering. Uh, it could, well, it could spook them. So what it's suggesting is just to cast uh, away or off to the side from where it is and then only cast at the, the one cast that you need to get to the trout that's lying below. All right. So that was uh, tips 81 through 85. And at this point, just going to open up to any questions, answers that maybe I can provide. Uh, it's just basically, basically uh, an open forum. And if you have anything, definitely just poke it into the uh, chat section. I'm watching it. I can see if anything pops up. And then um, while we're waiting for anything, I'll just shift over to... Uh, a particular video that uh, I want to show you that is a, a recent happening. Let's see. This was the total eclipse from the other day. All right. And this is pretty interesting. It happened It happened really quick. I, I sped it up, but you can see that uh, it gets dark. And we're just kind of chilling in the back here. And we did experienced the the full monty this round where it, it got dark just like night and then what was interesting is uh the birds got really quiet yeah so that was it maybe they thought it was evening maybe they thought it was um night or whatnot and then sure enough sure after boom we got the full sun again uh what i also noticed was that intensity of the light I mean, it was it was really bright before and after. In fact, all day, uh, and then later on, I went I went back out fishing, and I, I think it was just a one of the local ponds, and I was able to catch some 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 bass or two just playing around with the, some of the three D printed lures I've been making. Let's see, right right back here, uh, making some different ones, uh, and then. I did make a run over to one of the local ponds in our area and did really well on a damselfly. It's the bead chain damselfly. And let me see if I can get that video started. Bear with me. Let's see. Oh, this, this video is where I'm doing the, the 3D popper uh, that I was mentioning. And that's on that day of the eclipse. And... I'll let this one run real quick and describe what's happening, but I'm gonna have I'm gonna have to repoint it to uh, to the other video where I'm fly fishing in the local pond here for some bass. And uh, what was interesting about that was I hadn't fished it in about a year, and sure enough, uh, it was it was it was good. It was it was good to get out there and catch uh, some of these guys, uh, knowing that that pond is still. Uh, a good one. All right, let me see if I can pop it over. Yeah, this is going to be the first fish that I caught on the 3D printed popper. And I wasn't quite sure if I was going to get anything, uh, mainly because the, the, well, I hadn't fished it in a year. And oh, by the way, I did notice uh, that sure enough, I did get some good strikes. And what was nice was, uh, I did, I did see some V wakes as the bass were coming in, chasing the lure and whatnot. And, uh, a steady retrieve worked well. Uh, a little poppy retrieve was also working well. Um, but yeah, that's the 3d printed popper that, uh, I made. And, uh, Let's see, there's some other ones there, but I, I want to get you to the fly fishing one that I did where I'm I'm fishing the local pond here. We call it the Pond Behind In-N-Out Burger because it's just right behind the In-N-Out Burger restaurant. Um, bear with me, I'm having a little brewski right now, a little IPA. So do join me in an IPA or two or a beer while we're here. Okay, um, bear with me. I got to do some, some finagling to get 
to the other video here. Okay. Okay, here it is. All right. Let me blow it up a little. And what I'll describe for those that are listening on the podcast is this is the pond behind in and out Burger. And what I did was I fished with a damselfly, bead chain damselfly, a very easy tie. And it, uh, oh, I don't remember how many fish I caught, but I ended up going back to the video and it started doing another count. And I don't remember again how much it was. I think maybe it was like 15. But anyways, this is that bead chain. Uh, damselfly. So it's made with two plumes of marabou, one tied above the hook bend, and then another uh, just with the hook bend. And then um, you're using a figure eight uh, tying, um, I guess, tie uh, to secure the bead chain, bead chain uh, eyes. And that also gives it weight. It does a slow sink so it doesn't sit on top. Uh, but it does slow very nicely, a slow sink, and the bass, as well as blue kill, will strike. And here, when I'm fishing the pond, I'm fishing at, um, I'm not fishing or casting far into the pond. Instead, I'm working the areas closer to shore, either at an acute angle, or if not parallel, if I can. And, And in this case, where I've cast to behind me just to cover the water behind me and to check to see if there's anything lurking there. And what's nice about this is uh, in this particular pond over the years, I've noticed at certain times of the day, the bass will just start circling the shore or the near the bank in, in little mini schools of three to five, maybe six about this size right here, and they'll just kind of work their way around. And if you just keep working your way around the pond, you'll eventually hook a, t- a couple of them. Uh, and it's fun. I'm using a, a 10 foot three weight. Uh, and again, that bead chain damselfly. It's the white marabou one that I, I tie. Uh, you can tie it with, um, let's say, white for the bottom. Uh, plume and maybe another color for the top one, a brighter one. But I find that the just the straight white one has worked over the years. It's got bass, it's got bluegill, it's it's got catfish, and again it sinks slowly. I do have my polarized glasses on, so I can sometimes see the actual take uh, of the bass. Other cases, I'm watching for movement of the fly uh, line. So if I see a hesitation in the fly line, or if I see it uh, tug, get pulled, uh, set the hook. And in this case, I didn't bring a strike indicator. What I noticed with this particular pond is I seem to get better strikes when I don't use a strike indicator here. And it's just um, just fishing this particular pond for, well, almost 20 years. So, yeah. Anyhow, uh, there are some larger ones in there that kind of lurk below, but I didn't get anything that big. Uh, I think the biggest one maybe went two pounds. Uh, But that said, uh, what I wanted to do here was just see how the pond was doing and see if the bass population was as good, if not good, as it has been over the years. And then I just want to do one of these one fly. I'm just going to take one fly with me. And if I lose it, it's gone. I'll go home. Uh, And if I don't lose it, I'll just keep fishing until I make a round uh, around the pond. So I just went around the pond once. It's a fairly nice sized pond. And yeah, it was 15 fish, two bluegill, and 13 bass. And... I did see some beds, and I ended up catching one or two, I think, off their beds. But for the most part, uh, these were all active movers um, that I was I was catching them. And again, with that bead chain damselfly. Uh, when I get to the other side of the pond, I'll have to contend with this green, snotty, algae-like stuff. 
And what I do there is I'll cast past it around the edges or in the holes and hopefully see if I can entice a bass or two. Um, here I'm still uh, lucking out where I'm on the clear side where there's there's no, no none of that greenery uh, there to clobber my, my fish and fly. And I think, yeah, there he is. Another bass. All right. Bass number eight. <laughs> All right. And then let's see this one. Again, I'm still working the, the one side of the pond. And I believe this is a, a little bluegill. Yeah, I think it's a bluegill. And this one was 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 weird because I cast to the spot. I can feel the tap on it. And uh, it, it didn't feel like uh, the normal tap that I, I get with a bass. Uh, and so I was like, oh, okay, let me just keep cast again and uh, try that spot. And then this one that I'm bringing in right now, here's where I cast. And I actually saw the fly disappear. And that's what caused me to set the hook. I didn't see the bass. I just saw the fly in the water doing its little floaty, sinky thing. And when it disappeared... I just set the hook, and lo and behold, I got a bass on the line. And this is one of the bigger ones for this round. Right here. Got a big tail, kind of skinny. And I think this next one will be the, the biggest one. And here I'm having to cast over my offhand shoulder because the there's a fence as well as a tree line behind me. And so... Uh, by casting over the shoulder, I'm able to get it uh, to at least work the clearer areas where all this green stuff is. All right. Put a good bend in the rod. Found them. And I ended up banking them and bringing them up. And I believe this was going to be the biggest one. All right. Okay. Nice. Fun stuff. Okay. Uh, glad y'all were able to join. Uh this was the Little Red Book of Fly Fishing series. We go through tips 81 through 85. Next round, we're going to go through tips 86 through 90. And we'll just keep going till we finish the book. And then we'll probably switch over to, um, well, maybe another book. All right. Uh, three poem. That's a good one. All right. Cool. Yeah, that, that was the bigger one of the, the 15 caught that round. <laughs> Okay, um, so with that, uh, we'll do another podcast also. We call it the the Rambling, Fishing Ramblings. Someone suggested maybe doing, do, calling it the Babbling, Babbling Brook. <laughs> Anyhow, that one is just more of an open forum where I just start talking and showing maybe a particular thing that's happening in the area or maybe some plans uh, for some upcoming fishing events or trips. Um, but for this one, it's the same format. Go through the book. There's, It's a great book, The Little Red Book of Fly Fishing. I forgot when it came out. I've had it for years. Uh, I had the hard book version as well as the uh, Kindle version. And, well, I kind of use the Kindle one because it's very handy and I forgot where I put the other book. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so with that, appreciate y'all joining and hope to see you again all for now and next time we'll catch y'all later and good luck and good fishing